Amen, amen, and good morning. It is absolutely fantastic to, to be able to share together today. And uh, all of you that are watching online, thank you so much. Listen, I know that this has been some interesting days the past several weeks. I, uh, I respect that. I do understand that. It is uh, awful strange for me to, to be here and, um, and only have a few people uh, to, uh, to, to be able to have in here live with us. And, and uh, of course, they uh, all the praise band promised they're going to be our amen corner today. So uh, they're going to be shouting amen. But uh, it, is, it is so uh, fantastic just to be able to share together with you. I want to remind you that though everything seems to be in uproar right now and everything has changed, I want you to know that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ never changes. And uh, the same God that we served as we corporately came together three or four weeks ago is the exact same Lord and Savior that we exalt today. So uh, for those of you that are watching online with us, thank you so much. If you got your Bible, I want you to turn over to Luke chapter 23. We're going to, uh, to be looking at verses 26 through 46 this morning as I... Continue in our sermon series. For those of you that uh, have not uh, been able to follow over the past few weeks, let me tell you kind of where we've been. Uh, I spent about a month or so preaching through Isaiah 53. And Isaiah 53 is a beautiful picture. In the Old Testament, it's a beautiful picture uh, of the sacrifice that Jesus was going to be making for each and every one of us. And then last week, we, uh, we preached from the first part of, of Luke 23. And we looked at the trial. We looked at this unfair trial that Jesus was put on. We looked at the accusations that they made against him and, and how everything went back and forth between the house of Caiaphas, the high priest, and then in front of Pilate, and then from Pilate over to Herod, and from Herod back over to Pilate. And finally, Pilate uh, allows the Sanhedrin to... Uh, to have their way. And we ended last week with, with them, with Pilate releasing Jesus into the hands of these Jewish leaders and released him there for the purpose of a Roman crucifixion. Now I want to, I want to encourage each and every one of you today. If you've ever wondered if you're loved, if you've ever wondered if God cares for you I want you to know that he gave everything that there was to give for you uh, the cross is something that we in America today I believe have almost become desensitized to you you can hardly ride through a neighborhood that you don't see crosses that are decorating houses you go into houses all over the place and there are crosses everywhere probably uh, probably 15 or 20 just in my house alone. Many of you, especially the ladies, you will uh, wear necklaces that have crosses on them. We learned when we were little kids to draw crosses. We, it seems like, and I understand this, that the cross is the symbol that we have for our walk with Christ because we understand what took place on that cross. But I want you to realize don't ever become desensitized to what that cross was all about. That cross is not a decoration. That cross is not just something we wear around our neck. That was the place where your sin, where my sin was paid for. And I'll be honest, he was paid for in one of the most brutal fashions that you could ever imagine. Roman crucifixion, um, down through the history, has been known as being one of the most barbaric, uh, brutal types of execution that they have ever had. Uh, it was a long, drawn-out process. It was a process that shed a great deal of blood. It was a process that was placed before the entire people. It was a, a time of mockery. It was a time where people would come through and and laugh or throw insults or many times throw rocks and things at those that were being crucified. And for Jesus, this was the exact same. 
as we look at this passage of Scripture today, I want us to just look at three very important truths about the cross of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Three very important truths about what took place that day. And the first thing is this. He carried our cross. I want us to look, if you got your Bible, read with me uh, verses 26 down through 31. This is what it says. And this is after Pilate releases Jesus uh, over to the Sanhedrin. It says, as the soldiers led him away, it said that they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country. And they put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. And Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourself and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore, uh, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen, he said, when it is dry? This is a part of the crucifixion scene that we've seen a number of times. In fact, uh, I have seen it depicted in, in every movie that was ever made about, uh, about the crucifixion. Most of you can kind of see behind us. We still uh, are under construction. You know, this next week uh, or, or a couple of weeks from now, we were supposed to be having our, um, our Easter drama, Bow on Our Knees, and uh, it is a fantastic cantata, the choir has been working hard, the drama team. I want you to know we're still going to be able to do that. We're going to push it back right now to the first weekend in May. And so I encourage you, we're going to be doing it uh, the whole weekend, Friday night, Saturday night, and uh, Sunday morning uh, at that point in time. So you'll have an opportunity to be able to see it. But every drama that I've ever seen about the crucifixion includes this picture and this scene where they grab Simon of Cyrene and he takes that cross from Jesus and he helps. I remember when I watched The Passion of the Christ the first time, that, that moving scene where Simon takes that cross and he and Jesus are carrying that cross together. And one of the things that I've always thought about when it come to that, uh, that moment was that Simon was carrying the cross of Jesus and for Jesus. Well, I want you to know and understand, theologically, that's not what happened there. Simon was carrying his cross. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but let me, let me help you to understand this. When, whenever I sit and I thought about the fact that Simon was carrying uh, Jesus' cross, and then I realized that cross was not Jesus's. Of all the people that have ever walked the face of this earth, the only one who did not or would not have to bear a cross is the very one that did. And so as Simon knelt down and he, and he took that cross upon his back, I want you to know that is a picture of the fact that you and I could not bear the cross for with which Jesus was bearing for us. And then it looks and it says that there was this crowd of people that we're following. Uh, we don't know who all that crowd included. We do. Uh, we know some of them. Uh, we know the names. We know of only one disciple, uh, John. Uh, that uh, of all the the, uh, the twelve disciples, of course, we know Judas uh, had uh, pretty much uh, discredited himself. But of the other eleven disciples, the only one that we know that was even at the cross was John. We know that Jesus's mother was there. We know that. Mary Magdalene was there, and there's a few other ladies that it says were there, but this passage of Scripture says that it was this group of mourners that were following. You know, the interesting part of this first uh, section of, of this crucifixion scene is that the whole focus of that is on others. The focus was on Simon of Cyrene. The focus was on this crowd of people that were following. The focus was on all of these. Jesus addressed them. You know why? Because that day, Jesus carried our cross. 
the cross, a place of crucifixion, a place where, where Jesus was paying a price that you and I could not pay for ourselves. For those of you that are watching right now and maybe you're not fully understanding everything that I'm talking about, I want, I want to explain it to you like this. The cross of Jesus Christ was because of the sin of you and I. Romans 3.23 tells us, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's me, that's you, that's everybody with the exception of our Savior that has ever walked the face of this earth. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 reminds us that the wages of sin is death. Now, uh, let me just explain that. Heaven is absolutely perfect and sin is not and so because of that, our sin, us choosing our sin, we put enmity between us and God. We put a gulf between us and God, a gulf that you and I could not cross. We could not fix. That's why Jesus died. When he carried your cross that day, when he carried my cross that day, he carried our sin. In fact, Scripture talks about the fact that he took the weight of the sin of the world. Now, I want you to think about that for just a second. Those of us that are listening right now, and if you're a Christian, I want you to think about how heavy sin is. I've heard people tell me before that sin will carry you farther than you ever hoped to go. It would cost you more than you ever fault you would have to pay and I think that's very true every single one of us we realize and we know and we understand uh, the the nature of sin and how uh, how controlling it can be in our lives and how blinding it can be in our lives now I want you to imagine taking just that feeling that you have and multiplying that but times every single person in the world the weight and the sin of the world was on that cross that day and on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He carried our cross. But the next part of this, and it amazes me, he brought our forgiveness. Look at verses 32 down through 43. It says, two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. It says the people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said he saved others, let him save himself. If he is God, if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there, uh, uh, hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. The other criminal rebuked him. Do, do you not fear God, he said, since you were under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today, he said, you will be with me in paradise. Uh, as they get to Golgotha, they get to Calvary, the place of the skull, the, the place where the Romans did their executions. They took Jesus and they had his cross there. And there was a, a criminal on one side of him and a criminal on the other side. And they attached each one of them to the cross and Jesus, they the scripture teaches us that they took spikes and they pounded them through his wrist and through his feet. And they nailed him to that cross. 
And then they took that cross and they placed it there in the hole that they had dug. And, and, and there, suspended between God and you and I, was our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He was there with the rest of the criminals. It says that one of the criminals looks at him and begins to make fun of him, begins to jeer at him, begins to hurl, it says, insults at him. If you're truly God, why don't you save yourself and save us? Can I be honest with you? That criminal could not care less if Jesus saved himself. All he wanted was himself saved. It was a very selfish act that he was doing. It said that the, the soldiers that were there, the Roman guards would come by and they would spit at Jesus and they, they would hurl insults at him and they, they made fun of him and they mocked him. And they said, if you're, if you're really the Messiah, why don't you come down off that cross? The Jewish leaders that were there that day, and I use that term very loosely, the Jewish leaders that were there that day continued to hurl insults at Jesus. I've read accounts where they would take rocks and throw them at people that were on the cross as they made fun of them and laughed at them. It was one of the greatest displays of ridicule and mockery that there's ever been. And folks, can I remind you that the one that spoke the world into existence was the one that was hanging there on that cross. The blood that was being shed that day was the blood of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It was the blood of God. As he shed that blood... Now, I don't know about you, but when I get pushed in a corner, sometimes I push back. When I get pushed into a corner, sometimes I come out swinging. When I get pushed in a corner, my first reaction is, is, is to defend myself, to protect myself. Well, as they took and they pounded those spikes into the hand of Jesus, I want you to understand that there's one thing that he never did. He never flinched. Max Lucado in his book, He Chose the Nail, says this. says, because Jesus was a carpenter, had, had the Roman soldiers of flinch that day in nailing those spikes in his wrist, that Jesus would have grabbed the hammer and did it himself. Never once did he flinch. He raised him up between two criminals. And one of the criminals just begins to scream at him. The people at the ground begin to scream at him. All the crowd begins to insult him. All the crowd hurls insults at him. And I want you to notice what Jesus did. Jesus, Jesus entered into a time of prayer. And at the darkest moment of history, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Those of you that are watching today, I want to give you some encouragement. I want to start by asking you to do something that's very difficult. I want you to think of the darkest, darkest sin that you've ever committed in your life. The one that's tucked away and hidden away. The one that you pray that nobody ever finds out about. The one that embarrasses you, the one that haunts you. Now, now that you've got that in your mind, can I remind you of something? He paid for that one too. There's nothing that you've ever done that was stronger than what Jesus did for you on the cross of Calvary. Through the cross, he carried our cross, but folks, he gave us forgiveness through God. Throughout history, Scripture says that without the shedding of blood, there was no remission for sin. You can go through the Old Testament and understand and realize the sacrificial system that was taking place there and the, the, the shed blood of those animals that were offered on that sacrifice. And as they, as they took that, 
uh, the, the blood of those sacrifices in the Old Testament. And they would take that blood and they would sprinkle it on the mercy seat before God. And as they sprinkled it on the mercy seat before God, it said that it was a savory offering. And that for one year, the sins of the people were forgiven. Folks, I want you to understand something. Scripture says at this moment, and this comes in the, in the book of Hebrews, at this moment when Jesus gave his life for you and I, it says that he marched through a heavenly tabernacle not made by the hands of man. And he marched through this heavenly tabernacle and he marched into the very presence of God. And it says that he marched carrying his blood, the blood that he was sacrificing on this cross. And he took that blood and he sprinkled it on the mercy seat before God. And forever and all through eternity, sin was paid for. That's forgiveness, folks. And there's no greater joy that I've ever had in my life than to realize that though I'm a sinner, that Jesus forgave me. Well, the last part of this, and we're going to close. Verses 44 through 46. And it's this, that Jesus paid our debt. I want you to look at it. It says, it was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining, and I love this part. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands... I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, it says he breathed his last. When he said this, he died. I want to kind of give you the picture of what these last moments were like on the cross. Scripture says that it became dark. Darkness came across. I've I've always pictured that as some great storms that were coming through some, I don't know exactly how it was, but I know that God says that it became very dark. And then it gives us a neat picture of something that takes place in the temple while Jesus is dying. I don't want you to overlook this. It says that the temple veil, the curtain, it was in the innermost part of the temple. It says that it tore, it rent in two from top to bottom during this moment. Let me explain to you what that, that veil was. When uh, all throughout the Old Testament and all the way up into this moment, in the temple that they had, there you had the outer courts and then you had uh, the inner portions of the temple. You had uh, the holy place. And then inside the holy place, there was a large veil, a large curtain. And on the other side of that was the holy of holies. Inside the holy of holies, there was a couple of things. But one of the things that I want to just tell you that was there was, uh, was the mercy seat of God. The ark of the covenant was there. And sitting on top of the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat of God. It said that they, it had cherubim that were, uh, were on top of that and their wings came inward. And it had to have been one of the most beautiful places. But let me tell you why it was so beautiful. It was beautiful because God said, that's where I will dwell with my people. Now here's the interesting part of this. You and I could not go there. We could never go through that curtain. You know why? Because God is holy, and we're not. And so throughout all the Old Testament and up to this moment, there was a veil that separated you and I from being able to be in the presence of God. There was a large curtain that separated us. At that moment, at that moment when it was dark, and Jesus, it says, cried out in a loud voice, to tell us die. What it means is this, it is 
finished. And can I remind you of something? Jesus didn't say he was finished. He said, it is finished. So what was he talking about? What was finished? The saving work that he came to do for you and I was complete. It satisfied God. The work that he came to do to pay the ultimate price for your sin, for my sin, to pay our debt and to mark it paid in full. I want you to know that when he said it is finished, he meant that the saving love for you and I was complete through his blood on the cross. And then it said he bowed his head and he died. But can I give you a beautiful picture? That curtain that was in the temple that day, it says that it tore in two from top to bottom. In other words, through Jesus Christ, through the cross of Calvary, you and I can go before God. We're going to sing a, one last hymn. I, Kind of sprung this on the guys a second ago. So I'm going to get them to come on up and kind of begin to get ready. Because we're going to sing one last little hymn together. It's a hymn that my guess is that every single one of you are going to know. But before we do that, can I encourage you with something today? Every bit of what took place on the cross... It's because God loved you with an everlasting love. Some of the greatest verses of Scripture are the ones that we quote most often. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. The next verse says, But God did not come into the world to condemn us but that the world through him might be saved. Romans 5, 8. God demonstrated his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. As Peter begins to play this hymn that we're going to sing together, I, I just want to encourage you. I wasn't certain how we could even do a, an invitation like this, but I just feel led that that there are a number of you that may be listening to this right now who you've heard the stories of the cross you've seen the movies you've seen it depicted you've even read about it but can I just be honest with you seeing it and hearing it and reading about it is a whole lot different than knowing it and experiencing it When Jesus died on that cross, he did it for you. He was paying your price. And he's offered you today an incredible gift of salvation. If you're listening today and you've never trusted in Christ, let me, let me just tell you, right there in your home, wherever you're listening right now, I want you to know and hear and understand that the only thing that's keeping you today from being saved is you. And it's you saying no to the gift of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He did everything there was to save you. He paid every price that could be paid to save you. Now the question that remains is this. Will you trust him you're saying brother Brad how do I do that Romans 10 9 and 10 tells it says if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved it says for with the mouth and with the heart man receives resulting in salvation and with the mouth it says we make that confession. And so if you want to give your heart and life to Jesus Christ today, 
I want to lead you in a time of prayer. And I'll be the first to tell you, there's nothing, there's nothing special or magical about this prayer. But there is something absolutely incredible about the God that we pray to. And if you will call, as that verse says, if you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I want to lead you in a prayer and right there in your home or wherever you are, if you would like to give your heart and life to Jesus Christ today, I want you to mean this with everything you have. I want you to pray this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And Lord, I know that the wage or the payment for my sin should be death. My sin separates me from you. Thank you, Jesus, that you died for me. Thank you that you carried my cross. Thank you that you paid my debt. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. And save me. And it's in your name I pray. Can I tell you something today? If you, there in your home, if you just prayed and asked Jesus to be Lord of your life, Romans 10, 13 says, For all who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. Praise God for that. If you would do me a favor, if you, would, if you want to leave a, 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 a comment there at the bottom, or if you want to send me a private message, man, I'd love to be able to just talk with you more about this.